Good evening, everyone, and hello from Cork in Ireland. Uh, my name is Joanne Crowley, and I'm Secretary of the Board of Management of Matter Day Academy. On behalf of the Board of Management, I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's uh, talk by Father Conor McDonough, a priest in the Irish province of the Dominicans. For those of you unfamiliar with the Matter Day Academy, this is a new Catholic second level school opening in Cork this September. It's planned to implement a particular type of education called liberal arts or classical education at the Matter Day Academy. Uh, Father Connor will talk tonight about liberal arts education, the Irish contribution. Father Connor is a native of County Galway. After secondary school, he completed studies in both science and theology at the University of Cambridge. He then taught theology in secondary school before joining the Order of Preachers, the Dominicans, in 2009. Uh, he was ordained a priest in 2016 and then undertook further studies in theology at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland, focusing on the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin. Uh, Father Connor is the co-founder of the Aquinas Institute of Ireland, and they run a week-long summer school every summer in Ireland. Throughout tonight's broadcast, you'll have the opportunity to ask any questions through the live chat window on the right-hand side of your YouTube page. Uh, feel free to type in questions at any stage during the broadcast, and we'll try to address these at the end of the talk. I'm delighted now to hand you over to Father Connor for his talk entitled Liberal Arts Education, the Irish Contribution. Over to you, Father Connor. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Joanne. I'm going to start um, by giving people two riddles to try to solve um, and see if you can uh, come up with the answers in the chat. I won't be able to see your answers, unfortunately, but two riddles and you'll see their significance later on. It's the first one. Born in clouds water, I am the sun's daughter. I seek clear skies, in storms I do not rise. So born in clouds water, I am the sun's daughter. I seek clear skies, in storms I do not rise. That's the first one. And then the second one. I share now with the surf one destiny in rolling cycles when each month repeats. As beauty in my brilliant form retreats, so too the surges fade in cresting sea. So they refer to two, two different um, objects. I won't give you any more hints than that. Um, and so see if you can figure out what those riddles are about. So tonight we'll be learning a little bit. We'll hopefully be learning a lot about liberal arts, uh, the seven liberal arts um, and how they were developed um, in the first millennium. I'm not an expert at all in modern um, classical education or modern liberal arts education. I have very little experience of it, but I'm really excited and enthusiastic about what you are all trying to do in Cork. It's something I think that's that's really, really important and strikes me as very wise um, the way you're going about it. Um, so I, I mentioned as well uh, in the title of the talk, the Irish contribution. Um, and just to make the point that the Irish will appear in what I have to say, um, but it won't be a talk saying how the Irish saved civilization. Part of my point tonight will be to show that the Irish contributed to this educational initiative alongside many other nations, alongside the English, alongside Roman speakers, the Italians and so on, alongside um, speakers of Germanic languages. Um, so that be the Irish contribution will appear, but it will appear alongside the contributions of many other ethnic groups. So we're looking at the world of education from around the year 500 to around the year 1000. I'm going to share um, a, my slides now, so hopefully um, you'll be able to, to see these slides. So education from around the year 500 to around the year 1000, it's unfamiliar territory to most of us. We often call this period the dark ages, but we all know that by this stage, by the year 500 or so, much of what we call Western Europe um, is now Christian. So Christians go from being a minority culture to the majority. And the question is then what happens when Christians are in the majority? 
as a minority, and I've written a little article on this called Gold from Egypt. I've sent the link to Father Eamon, so hopefully he'll share it in the chat. As a minority, surrounded by a dominant pagan culture, some Christians oppose that culture and said it's all demonic, but bit by bit by bit, the Christian attitude to that surrounding culture became a discerning attitude. They said, there's good things here that we need to, to, to pick out like gold um, and to leave the rest behind. And so they were involved in this uh, appreciative, um, searching, rigorous um, uh, search for the good and the true and the beautiful in pagan culture. But when they're in the majority now, what are they going to do? Are they going to say, well, we can get rid of all that pagan stuff now. We can get rid of all the poetry by Virgil. We can get rid of, you know, the, the Latin pagan dramatists like Terence. We can get rid of the pagan rhetoricians like Cicero. Maybe the majority Christian culture will now say, all we need is the Bible. That's all we need. And that might be what we expect, a culture based exclusively on the Bible. That might be what we expect if we're learning from today's pop culture. Um, because in today's pop culture, that's the sense we get about Christians. What Christians do when they're in control is they suppress knowledge, they suppress learning, they're anti-intellectual, they're against curiosity, they're opposed to the love of learning. And I hope tonight to show that the work of committed Christians in these centuries, these five centuries, far from suppressing knowledge, actually made possible the transmission of learning, learning both human and divine, and that all intellectually curious people today, in fact, owe these uh, generations of monastics mostly a great debt. And the liberal arts are a key part of this culture of, of learning. So the Western half of the Roman Empire, the Latin speaking half, um, began to fall apart in the fifth century, um, mainly after waves and waves of attacks from Germanic tribes, as you can see them. Uh, invading here century after century and the Roman Empire um, weakening in the face of all these invasions. Of course, the Germanic tribes also, when they invade, they tend to become integrated very, fairly quickly um, and sometimes are interested themselves in preserving, preserving the Roman culture that they had weakened. Um, you'll be familiar, if you've seen the movie Gladiator, you'll be familiar with this, these images from the battle in the opening scene where you have the um, the, the Roman army at their defensive outpost at Vindabona, which is now Vienna, facing these savage Germanic tribes. And this was the experience of um, the Roman Empire for several centuries. And it weakened, uh, it weakened their institutions. It cut them off ultimately from the world of Greek learning, which was always more creative than the world of Latin learning. And of course, it weakens the culture. If you think about it, in a time of fear, military spending is bound to go up and cultural and educational spending are bound to go down. No one thinks of writing poetry or copying manuscripts when you risk losing everything overnight. No emperor is going to divert funds to libraries or to researchers when he's constantly fighting defensive battles. So after these waves of invasion, in invasion there was a definite cultural decline. It's popular among Catholics and others to say that the Dark Ages weren't so dark, and that's true, but they were a little bit dark. There was definitely a cultural decline after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Um, but when this decline came, committed Christians, moved by their faith and their love for truth and beauty wherever it was found, dedicated themselves to gathering up the fragments of a civilization in decline. Um, and sometimes they were actually supported by Germanic kings who had now become Roman, who had become Christian, and so on. So one of the key figures in this process was St. Augustine, who actually planned, even before his conversion, he began planning a curriculum of the liberal arts. He didn't invent the liberal arts, they were there already, but he adopted this sevenfold model, not exactly the sevenfold model that we're used to. He had some slight uh, variations, but let's just say for the moment, the seven liberal arts are uh, grammar, rhetoric, dialectic, or logic. Um, music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. You can see them in this amazing image. I won't tell you where it's from, I'll tell you later in the talk, but it's an extraordinary um, image that represents each of the liberal arts um, as a, a female figure with lady philosophy in the middle and Socrates and Plato um, at her feet. And then underneath, outside the circle of philosophy, you have these Egypts, the poets and the magicians. That's not real knowledge. Real knowledge is the liberal, the seven liberal arts. Um, and that's what true philosophy is. Um, 
So Augustine, um, he, he began and he planned to write textbooks for each of these arts, grammar, rhetoric, logic, and so on. Um, just have a look here. Um, yeah, I should have said the, uh, the, the chart, um, one of the windows in chart, one of the, the doorways, I should have said, and um, actually represents the seven liberal arts as well. It's extraordinary. So here in the center, um, whereas in the other manuscript, we saw philosophy or wisdom was in the center. Here it's Our Lady, the seat of wisdom, who is in the center. And then the seven liberal arts around her, again, they're female figures. Um, and under each of the liberal arts is a writer um, who's most associated with that art. So music is represented there playing the bells. And underneath her is Pythagoras, the, the Greek um, uh, theoretician of music. You have grammar on the right as well. And under grammar is the famous um, uh, grammatical writer Donatus. And um, you have geometry and matched with, of course, Euclid. So here is grammar. Grammar is always represented holding a, a bundle of sticks and with a load of unruly kids because grammar was the first of the seven liberal arts. Um, and so she's about to, you know, bait grammar into them, basically. Um, and she looks like she has um, plenty of work on her hands there with those lads. And then Donatus is the other image. And um, then here um, we have geometry with Euclid, geometry on the left there. Um, and then music, of course, with Pythagoras. But all of these seven liberal arts surrounding Our Lady as seat of wisdom in a cathedral, which is really fascinating, I think. Um, but as I said, Augustine um, wrote textbooks uh, on the seven liberal arts, didn't write one on every one of them. And um, the earliest fragment of Augustine's writing on music, the De Musica, music really as a branch of mathematics, not so much practical music. Um, his earliest writing, the earliest fragment of his writing on music is the one you're looking at right now. And it's fascinating for a reason that we will discover slightly later. Um, so there were others then like Augustine. So in the centuries after his death, we meet other Christian figures who were committed to the same task of gathering up and transmitting the best of classical learning. So we look at two now, Cassiodorus and Isidore. So maybe these are new names to you, but they're really part of our culture. So by the time Cassiodorus, this cultivated, educated Roman reached adulthood, the Roman empire was, was dead. Um, and in Rome, there ruled a Germanic king, but a king who was a Christian and who desired to be a patron of classical learning. So initially Cassiodorus, is working with this Gothic king and with the Pope at the time. And he's trying to set up a school in Rome. He's inspired by earlier Christian schools like the school in Alexandria. Um, but what are the problems he faces in setting up the school and library? Constant war. He says, because of constant war, it was impossible. Just couldn't do it. And so after a trip to Constantinople, he's inspired to set up a secluded little community of scholars who would pray, study, and copy texts. And it was called Vivarium. Here is the probable location um, of this community. So he deliberately chose a physically really beautiful spot. And he was explicit in his purpose for this community. He wanted to help Christians to read and understand the word of God, but he knows that all these tools, the tools of the liberal arts will be helpful for that purpose. So he writes a book, called the Institutions, Cassiodorus's Institutions, which is halfway between a rule of life for a monastery and a textbook for studies. And he says in this, uh, in this work, the Institutions, I transmit here, not my own teaching, but the words of earlier writers, which we justly praise and gloriously herald to later generations. So he's aware everything's falling apart and I and my community are going to do our best to transmit the best uh, of what we know. And this monastery, this copying center was a huge success um, and a great deal of learning was preserved through Vivarium. So in a few centuries, we'll see books copied in this monastery in the south of Italy, turning up um, in libraries way in the north of England. I should have said as well, in the description under the video, there's a link to the handout. So don't worry um, about all the names. All the names I'll mention tonight, together with their dates, are on the handout and all the quotations I'll mention as well are on the handout. So that's Cassiodorus, Isidore of Seville. Among other things, he's the patron saint of the internet. So the instrument we're using at the moment, Isidore of Seville is the patron of the internet. He lived slightly later than Cassiodorus in Spain. 
And he too had a good education in liberal arts, but he knew that such education was at risk. So he compiled a, a hugely popular work called the Etymologies. It was like an encyclopedia of everything you need to know about everything. And that's why he's the patron saint of the internet. His Etymologies was like the internet of the day. It was in, published in 20 volumes and the first three volumes covered the seven liberal arts. And then you have volumes on things like medicine, law, the church, languages, animals, geography. He has stuff there on, on Ireland, um, agriculture, war, games, and so on. So just an example, when, when Isidore um, writes about the, the earth, uh, he's absolutely clear in the seventh century, he's absolutely clear that the earth is a sphere. It's, it's not a debate for him. The earth is a sphere, it's not flat. Um, and any educated Christian who reads Isidore in the following centuries would have known perfectly well that the earth was a sphere. We all probably learned in the junior search that people at the time of Columbus thought the world was flat and that he was going to go over the edge. It's complete nonsense. Any educated person in the Middle Ages knew the earth was a sphere. This is the oldest fragment of the etymologies you're looking at here. You can see in the bottom section, aurium, and he explains here the, the origin of the word for ears. He said it comes from, it's related to the, to the verb for to drink in, and, and we drink in sounds by means of our ears. That's how he explains it. So again, this fragment is really interesting for a reason we're going to discover in a few minutes. So you might never have heard of these men, but modern education owes them a great deal because their textbooks were the main basis for the education system in Western Europe for centuries, an education system that eventually then gave birth to, to universities. So at the same time as Cassiodorus is pulling back from Rome in the sixth century to found his community based on learning and also prayer, a young man called Benedict is pulling back from Rome to found a community based on prayer and also learning. It's important to note that Benedictine communities are not only places of prayer, they're also places of learning. Um, and that's true for all um, uh, monastic uh, rules, monastic communities in the West in all their different styles. The earliest monks in Egypt were sometimes quite anti-intellectual, not interested in study, actively opposed to it sometimes. But in Europe, at least, the kind of monasticism that grows here is very interested in study and learning. Although it's aware that there are spiritual risks involved, pride and so on. Um, but generally, they regard this risk as a risk worth taking. So in every monastery, whether in the tradition of Benedict or the Martinian monasteries or in the tradition of the Irish monasteries, at least some and sometimes most of the monks um, and nuns will be expected to be able to read. And from very early on, monasteries will incorporate schools, both for the education of young monks and for the education of children who are not monks. So you have the inner school for those who belong to the monastery and the outer school for those who do not. So we often have this image of monks, you know, at their desks writing on manuscripts, and that's a good one. They, they did that, but they weren't just writing books for the fun of it. They were writing books to stock their libraries, libraries that were used um, by the monks and nuns privately or in group reading. So for the vast majority of monks and nuns in our period, the love of God and the love of learning go together. Um, yes, I should have said, uh, here's an image of... Um, a monastery that never existed. It's, I mean, it's it's kind of a, an idealized version. It's one of the, I think it's the oldest architectural plan we have in Western Europe. Um, it's from about the year 800. And it was an idealized version of St. Gall in, in the east of Switzerland. Um, and was never actually built like this. Um, but it's just, it has everything that a monastery would need. So up in the top right, uh, you can see a circular enclosure. That was where the geese were meant to go. Why do you need geese? feathers for pens and so on, and eggs probably as well. Um, but you keep them away from the rest of the monastery, as you can see. There are breweries here. Uh, there's a place for, for horses. There's all kinds of different things. And on the left, uh, around the center, on the left-hand side, um, the school is there. Um, you can also see something unusual, an unusual architectural feature, the towers of this church in which an Irish monk was buried, Gaul himself. The towers of the church um, are circular. Uh, which is interesting. I don't know if there are many examples of that on the continent. Um, and you can just see a little bit closer up, it's labeled, it's the most amazing manuscript. And I've given a link um, to this that you can zoom in on uh, on the handout. 
And on the left hand side there, you can see um, where the school was meant to go. Um, so um, I mentioned that, that the love of God and the love of learning go together in monasteries. And this is particularly true in Ireland. So we sometimes think of Irish monks as the really tough guys, the weather bitten ones, ascetical and otherworldly. And that's definitely true. That's definitely part of their ethos. But they were also dedicated to learning. So Columbanus's rule was really, really strict, really ascetical. But there was also a place for learning and study too, both divine and, and human, the study of scriptures and the study of the liberal arts. This made Ireland a destination for lovers of truth. And um, there was actually a bit of a brain drain from England to Ireland um, in the seventh century. So Bede here, um, who's writing in his ecclesiastical history, he says that many, there were many in England, nobles and commons, who left their own country and went to Ireland for the sake of religious studies or to live a more ascetic life. And they go from monastery to monastery, from cell to cell, and the Irish monks welcome them, give them their food and give them teaching. They instruct them and give them books without asking for any payment. So a kind of an Erasmus program uh, avant la lettre. So th there is a brain drain and it's a bit of a problem um, because there's a, there's a monk called Aldhelm around this time who actually writes to an English monk who's studying way up in the Northwest of Ireland. He writes him a letter that survives. And he says, you've been studying the liberal arts there. He actually uses a strange phrase. He says, you've been sucking at the teat of wisdom in that cold place for so long now, and it's time you come back to England. It's time you come back to your own people. We have learning too. And he actually says, we have a real live Greek because the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time is a Greek, Theodore of Tarsus. And so Altham says, would you ever get back here? We have a real Greek, you can learn Greek from him, never mind what the Irish will teach you. So there was a concern um, that the English were coming to Ireland to learn uh, in, in numbers that were too large. Although Altham himself, his teacher was an Irishman, Will Dove, um, who taught him in Wiltshire. So the special focus of Irish scholarship was computus, the science of the calendar based on astronomy. I personally have to say, I find this, this area of studies phenomenally boring. And at the time it was phenomenally controversial. And it got the Irish into trouble wherever they went because they thought they knew better than anybody else how to date Easter. And that caused huge problems. But grammar was also a specialization um, in Ireland. Um, I, before I go on to, to, to grammar, I should say that these two fragments that we looked at, um, the reason I picked them out and the reason I find them interesting, the earliest existing fragment of Isidore's Etymologies, the earliest existing fragment of Augustine's De Musica, the reason they're interesting is because they're both copied by Irishmen. Um, the one on the left, possibly within Isidore's own lifetime, and it's written in an Irish hand. They're written in Latin, of course, um, but they can be identified as being written by, by Irishmen. Um, so the earliest stage of the liberal arts transmission, we have Irish people um, doing the transmission. So grammar, as well as the study of the calendar, grammar was a specialization in Ireland. And one of the great treasures of Irish civilization is a grammar book um, by Prishan, so a standard book of grammar, but that's covered in little notes, in glosses, in Latin and in Old Irish. It's in the monastery of St. Gall in the east of Switzerland. Um, I saw it uh, two years ago and I nearly started crying when I saw it. I was just so moved. This little book that contains um, the fragments which, which help us to reconstruct the earliest stage, well, the old Irish stage um, of the Irish language. And all these little notes reveal so much about the world of learning at the time. Um, so just uh, have a look at some of them. Um, you can see uh, this one, well, it's, it's kind of hard to make it out, but this little note, it says, um, Bendoch for Anvan Fergus, Amen. So a blessing on the soul of Fergus, Amen. More Urdom, it's very cold, <laughs> I'm freezing. Um, just very, very practical little note. Um, here's another little note, it's Durchadom, it's dark. You can imagine a scribe, you know, doing his best to keep going. Maybe his abbot has said, you know, we need to get this finished. And he's writing, you know, even at twilight, is Durchadam. And as well, some of these um, monks begin to, uh, to show off and actually write little notes in Oam. There's no need for them to be writing in this alphabet. It serves no practical purpose, but they know how to do it. And they're going to use this little secret code. What kind of things are they going to write in Oam? Well, this man writes, Fail Martin, the feast of St. Martin. 
And so it was obviously the 11th of November, and he just wanted to make a little note to say that uh, it's the Feast of St. Martin, just a little, a little note. Um, this one is a little bit more scandalous. It says lathered, which means hung over. Um, so this monk, maybe he was celebrating the night before a big feast, and he's just really struggling to write today. And he says lathered, which is actually, I mean, it kind of sounds like a good word to describe um, a hangover, lathered. Um, so thanks. Um, I, oh, and of course, the, the best, the best gloss in this manuscript, which reels so much. And it suggests that this, the manuscript was probably copied in Bangor um, in the early ninth century um, in County Down and ended up eventually in St. Gall. But this little, um, little note, this little poem um, was written by one of the scribes. It's Acher in Great Enough. The, the wind is wild tonight and the sea is, the sea is stormy. I mean, he's glad that that's the case because it means the Vikings are not going to attack our monastery tonight. You can see Luthland um, at the end of the, of the little poem, the Luchlany, as we say in modern Irish for the Vikings. So this shows that he's writing at a time of terror, but he's glad there's a storm and it means the monks are safe tonight. So again, it just reveals the kind of the human side um, of these studies. Um, so thanks to um, the study of grammar and computers and the other liberal arts, and thanks to Irish missionaries at work in Britain, this culture of learning, the Irish culture of learning, helped shape some of the great monasteries of England, especially in the north of England. So the greatest of English scholars, one of the greatest scholars in European history, Alcuin of York, he worked closely with an Irish monk, Joseph, uh, Joseph Scotus, Joseph the Irishman, and he corresponded with an Irishman called Colgo, who was possibly the abbot of Inishbofin. And as well, he wrote monks, he wrote letters to English monks in Mayo. I don't know if there are any people from Mayo watching, but Mayo Abbey was known as Mayo of the Saxons. There was a little colony of English monks there. And Alcuin, this great scholar who had a massive influence on Europe, um, is linked in with all of this Irish scene. So what happened on Christmas Day in the year 800 in Rome? It's a date um, that we should all um, remember. The year 800 in Rome on Christmas Day, what happened? Charlemagne is crowned emperor of the Romans. So he's a descendant of these Germanic invaders, but they've been Christians now um, for, for centuries. And they regard themselves now as, as Romans, as um, uh, the inheritors of um, the Roman empire. And so he's going to be crowned uh, Roman emperor by the Pope. Um, and this is a, actually a way also for the Pope to kind of reject the emperor who's still, there's still an emperor in, in Constantinople, but they've just kind of lost contact now and says, well, we're just going to make our own emperor, our own Roman emperor over in, uh, in Europe. So he, he's emperor of the Romans. He has that title, but more important than the title is the fact that he has this huge territory that is conquered and power to match this impressive title. So he and his descendants, kings like Charles the Bald, not a very flattering name, Louis the Pious, slightly more flattering, and Charles the Fat, the least flattering of all. These men were rich and powerful, and they were all exceptionally interested in founding and funding schools, schools in their palaces, and, and helping, out, helping out already existing monastery schools, finding good monastery schools, and then giving them uh, funds. So the period of their rule and influence is called the Carolingian period. And sometimes you'll hear, you'll hear reference to the Carolingian Renaissance, this, um, this uh, new springtime in learning. Now, they weren't all good. And, and Charlemagne um, you know, he committed genocide against the pagan Saxons, trying to force them to become Christians. So they weren't saints, um, but they did support education in a really significant way. So there are these very, very wealthy patrons of learning in Europe which is something that might attract scholars to their courts. Uh, so there's a pull factor, if you like. And there's also a push factor for the Irish in the ninth century. Why? Well, we've already seen an example of why, because the Vikings are attacking their monasteries. So rather than stay in Ireland and, and risk everything, some of them, some great scholars, will come to the continent and they will come to the courts of these kings and they'll say, we're here to sell our knowledge. We're here to sell our wisdom. Um, and the fascinating thing is that the Irish and, and English scholars who, who do um, come onto the European scene at this stage, they appear to Europeans, the people on the continent, like academic superstars. They're the smartest people in Europe. They know it. Everybody knows it. The Carolingian kings know it. So they put them in charge of their schools. So the Englishman, Alcuin, 
I've already mentioned that he's linked in with the whole Irish scene as well. He becomes the head of Charlemagne's palace school. Dongal, an Irishman, is made head of the palace school in Pavia in Italy. And he writes a letter uh, about astronomy explaining solar eclipses to Charlemagne. He also writes a poem about what? The seven liberal arts. Um, Jikul, another Irishman, uh, is teaching in another palace school and he writes a book about the measurement of the earth. And of course, again, it's obvious to him and everybody else, it's the sphere of the earth he's speaking about. The title of his work is De Mensura Orbis Terry, on the measurement of the sphere of the earth. Um, so just to give a few examples of Charlemagne promoting education, um, here's a, a letter that he wrote about the importance, if we're going to understand scripture, scripture contains allegories, he says, figures of speech, and so we need to study literature first. And so our goal is to, to, to understand revelation, to come closer to God, um, but secular studies, if you like, or human studies or um, uh, liberal arts, they're important in helping us to get to that point. Um, and then a later council um, says that this has really borne fruit. Um, uh, and, and look at this little last sentence. Thus may the church harvest the fruits of the double culture of divine and human learning. So Christians in this period, they're, they're not at all interested in saying you should only be reading the Bible or establishing just a monolithically, monolithically Christian culture. They want to get the best of human learning, including all the good pagan stuff um, in the service of their um, their faith, in the service of their faith and building up their own uh, Christian culture, which is open um, to the best of every other culture. Um, there's evidence at the time of the Irish arriving um, in Europe. Um, so Her Eric of Auxerre, a, a French writer, he says, Ireland braving the dangers of the sea is migrating en masse with her crowd of philosophers. When it says philosophers there, he means people who are experts in the liberal arts. Crowd of philosophers to our shores and all the most learned give themselves to voluntary exile to attend the bidding of Solomon the Wise. Solomon is his nickname for Charles the Bald. And these guys, the Irish, they knew how smart they were. Look at one of them, Sedulius Scotus, um, who com he compares the Irish to the Magi. So the Magi come from the East and they bring their gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh to the Christ child. But now the Irish scholars are coming from the West, bringing their precious gifts of learning. They have no problems with false humility. They know just how, how smart they are. Um, so um, the, just to give a few more examples of some other Irish names that appear in Europe at this time, these are all scholars um, who, are, who are teaching, who are um, involved in the Carolingian Renaissance. Um, just a few familiar names there to you. Some of them names have been lost. If you're looking for baby names, you could try calling your child Queen Chovrach or Fair Donach and see how far they get. Um, another little example of Irish um, learning is this amazing manuscript, a really extraordinary manuscript. You all probably know the little poem written on the bottom left of the page. It's Pongerbon, Misha August Pongerbon. Uh, the, this Irish monk on the continent is writing about his cat, his pet cat who's pure white, and the cat is chasing mice, and he says, the cat's chasing mice, I'm chasing the meaning of words. Um, but we can see he's not only interested in words, he's interested in all the liberal arts. So this little school book that he has includes just on the other side of the page, um, a little astronomical table. It shows, I, had, I only found this out two days ago, I was in contact with an expert in medieval astronomy, and I said, any chance you'd know what this table is about? And he says, yeah, of course, it's the moon moving through the signs of the zodiac. Uh, so moving in, in relation to the constellations um, uh, Leo and Cancer and so on. Um, and so he's a poet and he's also um, interested in, in basic astronomy. And the same book has um, little uh, Greek, declensions of Greek nouns, which is the other amazing thing about the Irish. We don't know how they knew Greek, but they did. Um, it's a mystery as to how these Greek, how these Irish knew Greek, but they were pretty competent, some of them. And they, again, they weren't afraid to, to show off that ability. At this time, hardly anybody in Europe knows Greek. But just have a look at the, the, the last few words here, the last line. In Greek, they read, Sedulius Scotus, ego agrapsa. Sedulius Scotus is the, the Irish scholar who wrote that poem about uh, the Irish being like the Magi. And it's his own hand that's writing this in Greek. I, Sedulius Scotus, wrote this. 
So there's an example of uh, an Irishman, uh, an Irishman's own hand writing in Greek. You're probably all familiar with this grisly looking character, um, John Scotus Eriugena, the greatest, uh, most original Irish thinker possibly ever. Um, and he's famous for translating works that were written in Greek, sent to the king, uh, uh, Louis the Pious, and nobody at the time could translate them until John turns up and he says, oh yeah, I know Greek. And he translates these works um, that are very, very important um, works in Greek. Um, and Thomas Aquinas, when Thomas Aquinas is a young fellow, centuries later, one of his jobs that he's given to do by his teacher, Albert the Great, is to compare the translation of John the Irishman with other translations. And um, that was only discovered just uh, a few years ago. Um, another example, this is Irishman um, writing a bilingual copy of the Gospels. So this is, uh, again, all in the ninth century. This is the Gospel of John, and it's written by an Irishman, um, and it has the Greek text. And then up above, it has the Latin translation, um, word by word. So you can see, en arche en halagos, in the beginning was the word. And then up above it in Latin, in principio erat verbum, at verbum. And then notice that he gives two possibilities of translating. You know, when you're translating, you're always aware there's subtleties. You could translate it by this word or that word. And he gives two words you could translate uh, logos with, verbum or sermo. So again, they're aware of linguistic subtleties. And then this is the best example of all. And um, this is, I think, uh, one of Paul's letters. Um, again, by an Irishman in Greek uh, and in Latin. And then at the bottom, Irish. So we have three languages here on this one page. Czech, the Rove, Morse, the Beg, Torby. It's a poem about um, pilgrimage. He says, going to Rome, sure, that'll do you good, but it won't do you any good if you don't have the king of heaven, this um, mock wura. You see the end um, of the poem, of the little poem there, mock -wura. If you don't have the son of Mary in your heart, pilgrimage won't do you any good. You've got to bring Jesus with you. Um, so again, this is all part of this world of Irish learning in Europe um, in the ninth century. Um, so the, as well as palace schools, these Irish scholars, they're welcomed in continental monasteries um, whose schools had never died out, but which were renewed then by the energy and knowledge of the new arrivals from Ireland. And the best example that I know of is the monastery of St. Gall in the east of Switzerland. It had been founded centuries before by an Irishman, Gaul, a disciple of Columbanus. You might know St. Gaul's, the, the GA club in, in Antrim. Um, but for years now, in, for the centuries after um, foundation, nearly all the monks are locals, they're Germanic speakers. But sometimes Irish, Irishmen pass through and sometimes they stay. So in the ninth century, two Irishmen who we know were part of the circle of friends of Sedulius Scotus, who we've already seen, Marcus and his nephew Muin Gall, they pass through the monastery and they're convinced by the community to stay there and to teach. Um, so we're told uh, that Muin Gall, this Irishman passing through Sangal, that he taught all seven liberal arts. So all of them. He wasn't a specialist, taught everything. And with the help of these Irish monks and the locals, this abbey school and library, they become the best in Europe. And among the students of these Irishmen are some figures who have Europe-wide influence in the writing of history, in visual art, and especially in music. So just here, um, you can see this is the list of monks who died in the monastery. And you can see the top one, um, it says, the death of Muingal, nicknamed little Marcellus, a little Marcus, um, a most learned man. Um, and underneath another Irishman called Phylon or little wolf. Um, and underneath that, Dulflon, um, uh, another Irishman who dies in the, in the monastery. But these are some of the things that are produced by the students of these Irishmen. And um, so you can see on the left, the earliest uh, stage of musical notation, the Sangal Nunes here, we're at the earliest stage of, um, uh, of uh, Gregorian chant being um, given notation um, and a new compositions. This is a time of great originality in musical compositions. And one of the great composers is Notker, um, uh, who's uh, uh, Notker the Stammerer, he's known as. He was a disciple, a student of Muingal the Irishman. And he actually describes bringing his first compositions he was just trying out some compositions. He brings them to this, his Irish teacher and Wingall says, try fixing this and that, but apart from that, it's brilliant. 
Um, so we can see that the Irishmen are really there at the foundation of musical culture in the West. And on the right, it's a little carving, a carving from the life of um, St. Gall himself. And this is a carving by um, Tuotillo, um, who is another of the, um, the students at the same time, this golden generation um, of, uh, of monks of St. Gall taught by uh, Irishmen. So I mentioned that they, apart from a school, they have an amazing library. This is what the library looks like now in St. Gall. It's one of the most beautiful rooms I've ever been in. Much, much later decoration, obviously kind of Baroque. Um, and we'll just say a, a brief word now about the contents of the library. And the amazing thing about this monastery, this library, which existed continuously um, from, let's say, around 800 is the earliest evidence we have um, up until the monastery was shut down in around the year 1800, um, when the monks were, were, were told to leave. Um, the amazing thing is that we have a catalogue of the library that's over a thousand years old from about the middle of the ninth century. There's a catalogue of the books that were in the library at that time, which is just unheard of. So it starts with, um, it starts with the scriptures, no surprises there. It you know, has books of the Old Testament, books of the New Testament, and then it includes the Latin fathers, people like Jerome, Augustine, and then the men of the curriculum. So these names should be familiar to you now. Isidore at the top, Cassiodorus at the bottom. So these textbooks that we mentioned and um, that were so important for centuries afterwards, here they are um, in the library of, uh, of Sangha. Uh, and maybe it was these, these exact books that were used um, by the Irish monks who were teaching the local uh, German monks there. Um, so Isidore, Cassidorus, and then Alcuin as well, this famous Alcuin of York, his books, there's a list of his books um, in the library too. And remember again, this is an English man who's connected in with the Irish with great respect, mutual respect. Um, uh, I should have said, as well as those curriculum books, um, you also have Lives of the Saints, you have law books, you have dictionaries, you have grammar textbooks, you have books of riddles, and you have a map of the world. And what's really amazing about this catalog is that it has a separate section for, as you can see on the top of the uh, image there, Libri Scottice Scripti, books written in the Irish style. So these are books that the, the monks at the time, they said, these books are a little bit different. They're written in a different style and we're gonna put them in a different list. We don't know exactly why they put them in a different list, but this is evidence of the kind of stuff that the Irish were copying and producing. And you have really amazing things here. So just to give you an example, in green, you have um, the poetry of Virgil. So this pagan poet from the first century BC, the Irish are still reading him. And just next to it, you have glosa, explanations of the poem, so that you don't, little notes to help you understand what the poem is, is saying. In red, you have uh, a textbook of arithmetic. Um, so again, one of the seven liberal arts, uh, a textbook um, that would have been used in class. And then the little purple um, uh, lines mark uh, books of poetry by Christian poets who imitated pagan poets. So they rewrote the gospels in the style of Virgil. And again, the Irish um, are very, very interested in these kinds of, of poems. Um, so there's also little details um, in, the, uh, in this catalog. Um, in the side, you have little notes that say actually where the books are now. So here on the left, top left, you can see the book of Esther. So this separate volume of, of, of the book of Esther from the Bible, it says, ad scolam, in the school. So the school had borrowed this book when the catalog was being made. Um, sorry, excuse me. Not sure how to turn that off. I'm borrowing somebody else's phone as a hotspot, so excuse me. Um, on the bottom right, you can see that this book was actually, one of the books was borrowed um, by somebody called Domna Rickart. Domna Rickart, which means Lady Rickart or Mrs. Rickart. So this is a book that was borrowed by a lay woman um, who's studying um, in collaboration with the monks in Sangal. And underneath, you can see it actually says, Redite sunt ad augiam et patrate sunt nove, which means these books have been returned to Reichenau, which is the monastery where that Irish monk um, was, was working. Um, 
and new copies have been made. Um, and so you can see monasteries are working together um, copying books from borrowing books from each other and, and copying them. And um, so again, just an insight into the kind of learning um, that was going on and the kind of culture there was um, in relation to these books. So the Book of Esther was in the school. What was the atmosphere like in these monastery schools? We might expect a vibe that was kind of grim and forbidding based strictly on the authority of teachers with no dialogue, no chat, no Socratic method. We might expect that, you know, preference was given to highborn nobles, but actually none of that was typically the case. So monasteries and nunneries, they, they definitely educated aristocrats, but many famous scholars at the time had no distinguished background at all. There's a great story about Charlemagne testing pupils, pupils who'd been educated by an Irishman, and he rewards, he gets these students in, in the palace school to um, write him poems. And the, the, the lowborn, using the terminology of the time, um, worked really, really hard and produced very good poems. And the sons of aristocrats were a bit lazy and kind of didn't try very, very hard. Um, and Charlemagne says to the, to, the, um, to the aristocrats, you're lazy old dandies and you're going to get no rewards from me in life unless you, do, you, you apply yourself to your studies like these commoners. Um, so that story might not be true, but it tells us something of the mentality of the time the meritocratic attitude they had to studies. Um, Gerbert of Aurillac was the son of a peasant and he became the most famous teacher in Europe and eventually became, became Pope. Even if you had a disability like um, Notker the Stammerer, the, the composer of music that we looked at, um, he had a pronounced stammer, obviously, um, or Herman the Lame. Herman the Lame is a fascinating example. He, it seems he had spinal muscular dystrophy and he had great difficulty speaking. His parents gave him to the monastery of Reichenau that we've seen already. Um, and he was raised by the monks, but he wasn't just raised in a kind of a hospital. He was educated by them. They spotted that he was intelligent and he eventually ended up, despite his, his really profound disability, he made immense contributions in the fields of astronomy, geometry, and history. So what counted in this scholarly culture of the liberal arts was not noble birth or perfect appearance, but a well-formed mind. And what mattered too was being able to raise a laugh. So for example, I mentioned at the start of the talk, the Roman dramatist Terence. His plays, um, we mightn't give them to children to read today. The characters in these plays, they're, you know, they're prostitutes, they're soldiers, they're full of body jokes and really daft um, situations. But they were used at the time to teach Latin to children, presumably because they were, they were funny and slightly scandalous. Um, and funny stories as well were invented for use in the classroom. So in St. Gall, there's one collection of these animal stories. You know, the way we teach things to children by, you know, telling them animal stories. They did the same in these monastery schools. So there's one story and it would have been used to teach the children Latin. And it says it talks about a calf who's separated from his mother. Um, and the calf is mooing and mooing and mooing in distress. And a stork comes along and says, what's wrong with you? And the calf says, I haven't seen my mother in three days. I haven't drunk a drop of milk in three days. And the stork says, don't worry about that. I haven't had milk all my life. And then the calf says, and look at your legs. They're as skinny as anything. <laughs> so these stories um, about animals, these lighthearted fables are told to raise a bit of a laugh in the classroom. So it wasn't a grim atmosphere. Um, and the idea, I suppose, was that if you're laughing, you're more likely to learn. As well, we see a similar atmosphere in um, a Latin class in a monastery in Kent in the southeast of England. So there was a teacher um, in the uh, around the end of the 10th century called Alfred, and we have his manuscripts that he used in class. So here is his list of vocabulary, a bilingual list of vocabulary that he wants to teach to his students. So if you if you look closely, you'll recognize some of the words from modern English. The top one there, piscator, is the Latin for a fisherman. And just below, it's translated with the Old English fischere. Um, venator, the Latin word for uh, uh, somebody who's hunting, is translated with the Old English word hunta. And down at the bottom, if you're a fan of Lord of the Rings, um, you'll recognize these words. The word for a giant, gigas, is translated ent. That was the Old English word for um, a giant, ent, the, the trees, the giant trees in Lord of the Rings. So this teacher had to, had to teach the vocabulary 
And we might expect in these schools that he would have taught it by rote and really in a, in a very um, strongly disciplinary way. Um, but actually what he did was he got the students to act out role plays. And this is quite typical in dialogues. He had dialogues written where the students would use all the vocabulary and use difficult forms of the verbs that they were learning um, in, during the course of a role play. It's how we teach languages today as well. So he has one student play the role of a fisherman that's teaching him the word piscator. And he asks him, the teacher asks the student what he catches. And the student then has to give him back a long list of names of different kinds of fish in Latin. So this is his way of kind of teaching them different species of fish in Latin. And then the teacher says, do you catch any whales? And the student says, no, no, that's far too dangerous. So again, slightly lighthearted sort of a, a dialogue. He asks the baker um, uh, why he gets one kid to play the role of a baker. And he says, why is your work important in society? And the baker says, you can live without my work as a baker, but you can't live well without good bread. Um, so again, it's a lighthearted and interactive way to teach a language. And this dialogue form is common across all the disciplines. So you find dialogues about arithmetic and astronomy and so on. So um, just here's one for visual learners. We might think that this is a very modern idea that in education you would uh, appeal to the visual to teach. We might expect that back then it was all just about the words on the page. No. Um, here, this famous Gerbert of Aurillac, whom I mentioned, one of the most famous teachers of the period, um, he was trying to teach rhetoric to his students. And so what he does is he puts a huge diagram, 26 leaves of parchment sewn together, and he has two columns side by side, each of 13 leaves, and then drew a big diagram on which all of rhetoric was explained visually. And he says it's a device admirably adapted for the ignorant and useful to the studious scholars in order to help them to understand the subtle and obscure rules of rhetoric and to fix these in their memory. So here's somebody who's inventing new methods um, in education. And there's more evidence of um, visual aids. So these are from, from the Monastery School of St. Gall in the ninth century. Um, and there's a, a classroom book that survives full of little mind maps. Again, we think mind maps are modern, but here they are using mind maps. Um, and this mind map is for use in music. It says there are three kinds of musical instrument. And the first one coming out of the fish's mouth is percussion, percussion instruments then string instruments, tensibilia, and then appropriately coming out of that end of the fish, the wind instruments, um, inflatilia. Um, another little mind map here, great little mind map. It's over a thousand years old. And um, this is the panther that represents the different branches um, of mathematics, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy. So if a child is trying to remember the different branches, think of each, each paw of the panther. Um, here's a rabbit. Um, who's used to build a little mind map about numbers, odd numbers, even numbers, numbers that are combined of odd and even numbers and so on. And this is a little bit more complicated logic um, and the different kinds of arguments that work um, in logic. Um, uh, and there's lots of pages of those. So I gave you riddles at the start. Um, and the reason I gave riddles at the start is because in the classroom, again, riddles were used. Um, so the first riddle that I gave you Born in clouds water, I am the sun's daughter. I seek clear skies, in storms I do not rise. I'm sure you all got it, the rainbow. That was the answer there. And so here again from Sangal, this is the riddle that was used in the classroom. And look at the little notes that are, that are written alongside it. Those are notes explaining the difficult words to, um, to students. So the teacher would have written in explanations of the difficult words. And um, so this is used for, for you know, beginners. And then the next one, I share with the surf one destiny in rolling cycles when each month repeats, there's an important hint, as beauty in my brilliant form retreats, so too the surges fade in cresting sea. So a link between this astronomical object and the sea, it's the moon. That's the answer there, the moon um, and the cycle of the, of the month. And so here you can see again, the riddle um, on the page, the second riddle, and he's, he's explained the word chiclis, they might not know what that means, and he explains it with another word, circulis. So just using a synonym to help them understand and to help them grow their, their vocabulary. So a real insight, I think, into their, their world of, of learning. Um, and again, think of how riddles engage learners. 
they, they get people thinking, they get people talking, they get people debating. It's anything but just cramming information um, into the head. So this educational culture of the monastic schools, um, in it, learning was meant to be fun. Um, and you can see this again, the, the evidence of this, in the fact that the students, when they write about their teachers, they write with great affection of their teachers. Um, and it's really beautiful to see letters from students to their teachers, just remembering their student days with great affection. Now we're coming close to the end, and I think it's important to say something about women. Um, uh, yeah, because they were they were involved in all of this as well. So this um, representation of the seven liberal arts that I showed you, the reason I picked this image is because it's later than our period. Um, it's from the 12th century, but um, it's from a monastery of nuns. Um, and it was from a manuscript made by the, by women, for women. It was from an encyclopedia called the Garden of Delights, the Hortus Deliciarum, and they wanted to have an encyclopedia for just so that they could know everything about everything. Um, and here they represent the seven liberal arts. And um, so it's rare to have books that are written by women for women in the Middle Ages. And um, this is actually from the same manuscript, uh, little portraits of the community at the time in the 12th century. And you can see they're all a little bit different from each other with all of their names. Um, and so a great insight into women's learning there in the, in the 12th century. But earlier on in, in our period, 500 to, to 1000, um, there was actually, you know, there was an extraordinary culture of, of women's learning in the monastery. So really early on and um, before the Carolingian period, there's a rule written for nuns in the great abbey of Farmoutier. And it mentions study explicitly, the importance of study. It mentions older nuns teaching new recruits and um, how to read and what to read and so on. And in England as well, it seems it was really normal for nuns to value learning. So Aldhelm, whom we saw already, who was worried about this brain drain to Ireland, he writes letters to nuns um, of Barking Abbey. There's the remains of it on the right hand side. Um, and he praises these nuns. He says, you're like thirsty bees. You're ready to draw nectar from the scriptures by means of your study. And he says, it's brilliant that you're studying history and grammar and law, and you write excellent Latin poetry. And um, so that's Aldhelm writing to nuns in Barking. And Wilton Abbey, on the top left of the slide there, that was another center of women's education. So Edith, one of the abbesses there, was she was famous, she was a princess. She was famous for her elegant writing in prose and in poetry. And she was famous for being able to speak French, Danish, and Irish fluently, like a native, as well as her native English. Famous too later on is um, the extraordinary musical scholar, musical composer and all around scholar, Hildegard of Bingen. That's her monastery in the bottom left. Um, but my favorite of all of these woman, women scholars of the period is um, not very well known, but I think she should be better known, Protsvita of Gandersheim. Protsvita of Gandersheim. It'd be great if she had a more pronounceable name, but there you go. Um, she calls herself the strong voice of Gandersheim. Here's her monastery on the left. The strong voice of Gandersheim. She actually rewrites the plays of Terence. So Terence, who writes these bawdy comedies, this pagan uh, Roman playwright, she says, OK, I'm going to read them all. Um, and they're really, really good and interesting. But there's a problem in them. Immorality always wins. And men are always winning at the expense of women. Often violent men win at the expense of, of female victims. So in a kind of a feminist twist, um, she has she sees the stories from the female perspective. She makes them Christians, the women in Terence's plays, um, and she has the men um, kind of falling on their faces at the end and so on. Um, and so she retells uh, these comedies um, to teach Christian virtue and also um, to, to put the shine the spotlight um, on women, which is really, really interesting. So these were the outstanding cases of women scholars of the period. But it was not a controversial thing for women to be educated in this culture um, or even very well educated. So hopefully, conclusion, hopefully it's clear now that the monasteries of Europe, as well as being centers of divine praise and centers of charity, they did their best also to transmit the best of human understanding. So being committed to divine wisdom did absolutely nothing to prevent these people from being committed to human wisdom. Their devotion to God seemed to support rather than to undermine their interest in human affairs and in the natural world. And that interest, as we saw, was typically omnivorous. Music and the stars, lyric poetry, 
and history, Latin and the vernacular. So none of the scholars we looked at tonight were specialists. Each of them in their own way wanted to learn all things. And in so doing, they worked together, Irish, English, Italian, German, men, women, all seeking truth at the heart of the church. Now I don't want to exaggerate my case, monastic education in the liberal arts, it was not especially original, not especially creative. It was traditional in the literal sense of that word. It was focused on handing on what was found to be valuable. And there doesn't seem to have been much interest in the period in extending the bounds of knowledge to a great extent. They weren't inventing new technology on the whole. They weren't developing new techniques in maths. And if you compare their intellectual achievements to what was going on at the same time in the Greek speaking world or in the Arab world, Arab, Arabic speaking world, um, they would have seemed like dwarves next to giants. But they worked with what they had and faithfully, cooperatively and good humoredly, they carried on their task of teaching and learning and building the institutions that would give birth to a network of universities. And when in the 12th century, the Arab and Greek learning filters back into the Latin speaking West, this educational network was ready uh, to receive this new learning with open arms, leading ultimately to the colleges and universities of today. So in a way we're, we're in their debt, but I think we can say more than that. Because you involved in Matter Day Academy, you are working to build an institution in which young minds will come together to seek truth in the sweetness of friendship. And this means you're more than the debtors of these past generations, you're their heirs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Connor for a most inspiring, interesting uh, presentation with such a rich content. I look forward to listening to that a few times again. Really, really, uh, thank you. I think we've time for a few questions now. Uh, so we have a few coming in there as the talk was going on. Uh, the first one is, the Irish monks learned Latin in the Middle Ages. Why should a school today teach Latin? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. And I think really the reasons are, are, are very different. Um, you're, you're learning Latin for different reasons. So um, at the time you wanted to learn Latin um, to access the best of, of, of literature and to connect in with this um, international world of learning so that you could move around and speak to people from who had different vernaculars um, and learn with them and teach them and so on. Um, and today Latin is not the lingua franca at all. English is. So English plays that role really um, that Latin did at the time. But I wouldn't at all say that Latin is, is pointless. Um, I personally only studied Latin as an adult. I tried to study it at school, but nobody was interested in teaching me. Um, and having studied Latin, it just opens a whole world to me um, in the Middle Ages and um, in you know, uh, the, the writers of ancient Rome. Um, and just to be able to access those in the original language it's really, really a wonderful training. It's a wonderful training as well to study a language that's kind of um, with a, quite a different grammar from English. It kind of stretches your mind um, quite a bit. So I just think it's intellectually valuable from that point of view. Um, but it, we don't, I don't think it's a, we studied for the same reasons that those monks did. Great, thanks. Thanks, Father Connor. Uh, we have another question coming in. Um, what do you think are the major challenges uh, facing Catholic education in Ireland over the next 20 years? Yeah, they're huge, huge challenges. Um, and I mean, obviously, a, a major question is whether the leaders in, in Catholic schools, you know, teachers, principals, boards of management actually believe, not only believe the Catholic faith, but believe in, in truth itself. Um, and that's, that's certainly not always the case. Um, so I'd be, I'm, I'm concerned. I don't think we should be um, alarmist or, or panicking necessarily. I think it's worth engaging with the educational establishment if we can find places in which to do that. Um, but I think it's really, really good um, that you're doing what you're doing in Matter Day Academy, just trying to, um, to have a, a, a sort of a, a mainstream school in the sense that it's connected in with the mainstream, but that's doing something quite different 
with truth at the center and with Christ at the center. Um, and I, what I would love to see is more, um, more kind of intentionally Catholic schools like yours um, uh, being founded or, or schools kind of taking a step in that direction. Um, and then I think people will see the clear difference between a school that really believes in truth and a school that doesn't really believe in truth. And the differences will become enormous. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see that kind of opening up and the evangelizing possibilities then when people say, well, if those Catholic schools have a, a different attitude to truth and learning, then maybe there's something interesting in the Catholic faith. Um, yeah, but the challenges are almost too numerous to really uh, yeah. go into. Yeah. No, and it's hoped that the Matter Day Academy in Cork will be the first of many across the country. So absolutely, please, please God. Um, a few more questions. I think we have time for one or two more. Um, what would you say to parents maybe who say that a classical education may not really prepare um, the students for the job market? Mm. Yeah, well, um, so you mentioned in the, in the little bio I, that I, I studied at Cambridge. Um, and what's really interesting there is to see top employers um, recruiting not only students who have um, studied finance or law or whatever, um, but who studied, for example, classics or theology or philosophy. And the reason they do that is because they know these people are able to think yeah. and they're interested in employing people who are able to think. Um, the kind of the skills, the training that you need, okay, that'll be necessary at some point. Um, uh, but what they're really interested in is, is people who are able to think. So I think um, as far as I can tell, a classical education is really aimed on, on, on you know, enabling and, and liberating students in, uh, to, to, to think um, for themselves and to, to think well and to think rigorously. Um, and I think in any, in any area of the job market, um, that's going to be beneficial. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That independent thinking. Yeah. I, the, this question has come in from someone who's actually done a bit of research, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So an article you wrote last year in the Irish Catholic, you wrote, Jesus is a teacher guiding students into truth. Lovely quote. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role both um, a curriculum and a faculty of teachers have in making Christ the teacher present in the classroom? It's a great question. And, you know, the, the real experts in, in this um, kind of uh, idea that Christ is the main teacher in the Catholic classroom, um, the real experts are our sisters in, in Nashville, in Tennessee. There's a congregation of teaching sisters there and they have a, a community in Limerick now. Um, and it'd be lovely to see them involved in, in education in Ireland. And that's really a major emphasis in their, their spirituality, if you like, of education, is that Christ is the teacher in the classroom. Um, but I think really it's um, the, the way he becomes present in the classroom is if he's present in, in our lives. It's not just a matter of kind of an ideology in the classroom that, you know, for example, if we have a crucifix on the wall, you know, that's the job done. No. It's a little bit like the poem that we saw about the Irish guy writing about pilgrimage saying, you know, if you go to Rome and you don't have the king of heaven in your heart, there's no there's no point doing it. And I'd say something similar about Catholic schools. If those who are involved in them don't have Christ in their hearts, then the Christian symbols and so on and on the on the wall, they become empty symbols. So really, he becomes the teacher in the classroom by, you know, our own personal discipleship. And um, if the teacher is a, is, a, is a disciple, if the principal is a disciple, really seeking to follow the Lord, reading the scriptures every day. That's how Christ becomes, I think, the teacher in the classroom. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Father. I, I think we probably better cut it at that in terms of the questions. But just to thank you once again for a wonderfully interesting talk. And uh, thanks to all of you for linking in today. And uh, I suppose if you want to, and I think I would encourage everyone to listen to this talk again, because it's phenomenally interesting. So the talk will be available to replay via the Matter Day Academy website on www.matterdayacademy.ie or alternatively on the YouTube channel, the Matter Day Academy YouTube channel. Um, and I'd ask, for, you know, you can support Matter Day Academy very much through your prayers. Uh, but if you'd also like to support it financially, there is a donate button um, on our website. And you can also sign up on our website to receive the regular newsletter from the Matter Day Academy. Um, 
Today is the second in a series of live videos and uh, the previous video from Elizabeth Sullivan is up on our website already. Um, and all of these um, live uh, video talks address particular reference to Catholic ethos and adoption of classical, curricul classical uh, curriculum. And uh, our next one um, will be on Friday, the 24th of July, um, and it'll be by Dr. Thaddeus Kalinsky. Um, and he's agreed to do a talk for us on the Socratic method as a mode of teaching in a Catholic school. So Dr. Thaddeus Kalinsky, uh, the Socratic method as a mode of teaching in a Catholic school. So look forward to um, seeing you all or uh, you all joining in uh, for that third um, video or third live stream uh, talk. And uh, so I'll now hand you over to Father Eamon Roach in Fermoy in County Cork to uh, close tonight's uh, live broadcast uh, with a prayer. Thank you, Joanne. And thank you, Father Connor, for that very, very fascinating uh, tour of uh, liberal arts education throughout Europe. You really gave a sense of the, the joy of learning that they had the monks and um, also the sense of humor that they had and realized there was so much humor in those manuscripts and all their notes and their sketches and drawings and, and the riddles. They had some really creative ways of uh, getting the students thinking and, uh, and remembering, um, remembering their material. Uh, so it sounds like you you enjoyed the research as well, visiting the, the libraries in St. Gaul. Uh, just to say as well, Father Connor, you may, you may or may not remember, uh, this coming Sunday, the 5th of July, is the anniversary of my ordination to priesthood, actually. And you might remember five years ago, you were there as a deacon at the altar in St. Coleman's Cathedral. So uh, happy memory. So Praise God. It, it, exactly. It's been five years for me as a priest. It's been four years for you, I think, as a priest. So... They've been wonderful, wonderful years for me and, and you also, I think. So happy memories and thank you very much. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So I'll finish now with a prayer. I'll just bring up the prayer on the screen. And we've been praying with Our Lady of Knock and, um, in the last video and tonight also. So we'll just thank God for this evening's uh, wonderful talk, for the inspiring talk. What a great heritage we have uh, in our Catholic faith, a great heritage in education. And may it uh, continue into the future. And may, may we be part of the renewal of Catholic education in our times. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lady of Knock, Queen of Ireland, you gave hope to your people in a time of distress and comforted them in sorrow. You have inspired countless pilgrims to pray with confidence to your divine son, remembering his promise. Ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find. Help me to remember that we are all pilgrims on the road to heaven. Fill me with love and concern for my brothers and sisters in Christ especially those who live with me. Comfort me when I am sick, lonely, or depressed. Teach me how to take part ever more reverently in the Holy Mass. Give me a greater love of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Pray for me now and at the hour of my death. Amen. Our Lady Queen of Knock, Queen of Ireland, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Gaul, pray for us. And Saint Dominic, uh, pray for us. I'll finish now with a blessing. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, good night and God bless.